Hello Year 11 and welcome to some videos based around OCR History B Public Health. This particular video is on the medieval period which is 1250 to 1500. There will be others in the series that focus on the next three time periods. So it's really important as you complete your exam to know the different time periods and the dates that come with those along with the centuries that are attached to them. So the exam board can ask you questions that name the time period. So, for example, medieval England, they can just give you the dates, for example, 1250 to 1500, or they can just give you the centuries, the 13th to the 16th century. So it's really important that you know the names, the dates and the centuries of each of these time periods. So our first time period, which is the one that we are focused on in this video, is medieval England. That is between 1250 to 1500 and it's the 13th to the 16th century. It is worth noting here that medieval England could also be known as the Middle Ages. So you could get that in a question as well. So that name, medieval England or the Middle Ages, the dates and the centuries are what you need to know for this particular time period. The second time period that we have is early modern Britain. The dates for this time period are from 1500 to 1750, and that is the 16th to the 18th century. The third time period is Industrial Britain, which is from 1750 to 1900, which is the 18th to the 20th century. And finally, we have Modern Britain, which is 1900 to today, and that is the 20th to the 21st century. So within this particular time period of medieval Britain, there are four different things that the exam board say that you need to know. So they are the characteristic features of medieval Britain, so an overview of what life was like at this particular time, what living conditions were like in this particular time, including housing, food, clean water and waste, what the responses to the Black Death were, what people's beliefs were and what actions were taken against the disease, and finally, approaches to public health in late medieval towns and monasteries. So I want you to start with a visual for um, the way that medieval towns appeared. So we're going to have a look at an interpretation which was created in 1976 um, from a publication called Look and Learn. We know it's an interpretation because it's after the time period that has been studied. And the provenance that you can see on your screen says that London was such a filthy place at the time of the plague that nothing could be done to stop the disease. So I think this image sums up what medieval towns were like quite well. And the artist who created this clearly wants us to understand that medieval towns were not sanitary places to be. So if we have a look at the image, we can see a man suffering from deadly plague who's fallen to his knees while a dog sniffs at him suspiciously and townspeople are backing away in alarm. We've got a woman who is throwing rubbish from or what is most likely to be excrement from the window of a top floor building due to the lack of waste disposal methods. We've got pigs who are roaming freely through the streets, searching for food amongst the waste. The street itself has an open drain that is running through the middle of it um, because of the lack, again, of, of ability for to get rid of water. And in the distance, we can see the body of a plague victim being loaded onto a common cart by two hooded figures. So, as we said, the caption for the picture declared that London was such a filthy place at the time of the plague that nothing could be done to stop the disease. And it is true that medieval England 1250 to 1500 was dirty and full of dangers to health. But we need to understand why and whether there were any efforts to tackle the health hazards that faced medieval England. To enable you to succeed on this exam, you do need to have a basis of knowledge of an overview for each time period for what the key themes at this particular time in history were. So we're going to start with religion. So firstly, almost everyone in medieval Britain was a Christian and a member of the Roman Catholic Church. So at this point, the Protestants don't exist. Henry VIII hasn't come along and torn the church apart. So everybody is a Roman Catholic. Every parish had its own church and there were also many cathedrals and monasteries. And remember, a monastery is home to a monk. So we'll hear that key term as we go through um, medieval Britain. 
Next we have government. Medieval people were ruled by kings. Kings taxed their subjects, but the money was usually used for the king's court or to fight wars. So that money was not put back into society to improve things for ordinary people. It was usually used by the monarch themselves. Medieval kings ruled through divine right, which means that they believed that God had put them in the position that they had. And therefore, it was very, very difficult to challenge a monarch at this time. Medieval government did far less for people than we expect today. And just a reminder that this phrase, laissez-faire, which we'll hear a lot as we go through uh, these videos, means that we don't have intervention from the government. We then have limited technology. So technology during this time period was very limited, the majority of things being made by hand. We've got water mills and windmills, which were the most powerful machinery available at the time. And printing presses were probably the first real technological development that we see, but these don't appear until the 1470s and they're not very widespread. So right at the end of our time period, um, but it is a move in the right direction. No one had yet developed powerful lenses, so there's no microscopic creatures such as microbes and germs that have been discovered at this time. Therefore, people are still very unaware of what is causing illness. For farming and food, the majority of medieval society were peasants who did hard physical work on the land. We had bad harvests which could lead to starvation and death for peasants, and this was quite common. England was famous for the wool ex it exported throughout Europe by 1500 and its trade added to the nation's wealth. So the main thing here really is this uh, awareness of the fact that the land is so, so important to the peasant population uh, and harvests are absolutely vital um, to make sure that people are able to survive. In terms of towns, as late as 1500, there were only approximately 15 towns in England that had a population of more than 10,000. So the vast majority of people are still living in rural areas. Medieval towns are small, but they are busy places and they contain many different crafts and trades and they become especially busy on market days, which, of course, is where disease is going to spread very quickly. And the final thing worth note here is the influence of ancient ideas. So the ideas of the Greek and the Romans are still very much prevalent in medieval England, especially a belief uh, called the four humours. Um, so the four humours, just a reminder that people believed that the body was made up from blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. And the idea was that you had to keep those in balance if you were to be well. So that is still an idea that people are holding on to. And that is naturally going to hold people back from actually finding what causes disease in medieval England. So within the public health exam, if you are asked uh, about living conditions as part of any of the questions, you are able to speak about housing, water, waste or food. So we're going to start off with housing and we're going to start off in the countryside or rural areas, which remember is where the vast majority of people were living at the time. So we would have had a lord of the manor who lived in a large house who has the most power and authority over the area. Peasants' houses would have varied in size, but lots or the majority of people were living in small huts, which had only one room and they were made of woven sticks and mud. Animals were valuable, so they were kept in the house at night. So animals are obviously producing milk, meat and um, their fur uh, can be used, obviously, for clothing, etc. So very, very valuable. So they're kept in the house with people. So we can imagine um, the smells that are in these homes are not very pleasant at all. We also have an open fire, which you should be able to see on screen in the centre of this peasant's house. Um, and this fire would be used for cooking and for warmth. There's no chimney, so smoke would spread throughout the home and escape through the thatched roof. And this would obviously cause respiratory problems. And we have windows that are very small, but there are only wooden shutters on there. So there is no glass at this point. In comparison, in the towns, remember, we haven't got many people living in towns. We've only got around 15 that have a population of over 10,000. But we do have some people living in town. So let's have a look at their housing conditions. Firstly, you might have a rich merchant or trademan who might have owned a house just like the one that you can see on screen. You've got the upper floors that are jutting out, which are called the overhang. So I've said before, if you visit places like York, you can see uh, houses like this that still remain. Uh, and the upper floors are jutting out to provide more floor space at the top of the building. 
In the Middle Ages, houses like this would have had thatched roofs where insects and rats would have lived. Obviously, we're going to come to the Black Death later. So in terms of the disease spreading, this would have contributed to that. Houses were built close together in the centre of towns and it was only the very wealthy who had gardens. The workshops of craftsmen or traders would have been part of their houses. So that would have been this section here at the bottom, which would have been where the workshop was. And people were expected to clean their drains and the street near their houses, but not everyone bothered, which was adding to the bad smells which medieval people believed caused disease. So we will come to miasma again later. But remember, that word means that people believe that bad smells were the cause of disease. So again, just a reminder that a question on living conditions would enable you to speak about housing, water, waste or food. So we're going to have a look now at water to start us off. So in terms of in the town, we had something called a conduit and these were lead pipes which brought spring water to some town fountains from the countryside. So these were starting to develop around town to enable people to have access to water. We then got water sellers who sold the water that they collected from the conduits in leather sacks um, and they could be sold to people that could afford it. In the countryside, in comparison, the vast majority of people got their fresh water from springs, streams or wells. So springs fed into at least one well in the village where people could access water. Streams were also very common for people to get water from, but they were often used by animals and for bathing too. So the water that was in these streams was often unclean. Obviously, people still hadn't made the link between um, clean water um, benefiting people and dirty contaminated water causing disease so people continue to drink from the streams but this was obviously going to cause illness and um, just a reminder here that you didn't have to drink water so lots of people simply drank alcohol instead so it could be ale that's made from barley cider from apples or mead from honey and all of these would have been heated which would have meant that any of the bacteria within these would have been killed off people didn't realize that that was a benefit that they were gaining from because they didn't understand this at the time but nonetheless drinking these drinks would have actually been safer than having the water at the time Let's have a look at waste. So in the town, we had public latrines, which were in the markets. So just a reminder here that a latrine is a toilet without any flushing system. At the end of market day, the streets were full of waste from food and other goods, including the dung from animals, which also covered the floor. So again, the smells in these in these places would have been very unpleasant. In 1290, in an attempt to try and improve things, rakers were introduced in London to clear the streets and dispose of rubbish outside the town walls. So by 1500, almost all towns had them. So as much as this wasn't getting rid of the problem completely because it was moving rubbish from within the, the centre of the town to the outside and dumping it there, there was an acknowledgement at least that rubbish needed to be out of the centre of towns, which was going to improve the situation. And when a latrine was full, so remember a latrine being that toilet without any flushing system, we had somebody called a gong firmer who would get rid of the waste and then sold that to farmers as fertiliser uh, or dumped it into streams. So this is where we get names such as Shipbrook, which appeared in Exeter as a result of the amount of um, excrement that was being dumped into streams by gong firmers. So they didn't always do the best job. In the exam, it would be brilliant if you could reference key terminology like latrines, rakers, gong firmers, uh, conduits, water sellers all of those words are in red for you on the screen they are words that i would really be encouraging you to use so that's the waste in towns let's have a look at in con in the countryside in comparison in each garden in the countryside we had a midden so a midden was a dung hill or a pile of rubbish and this would include floor sweepings waste from cooking and broken pots they would all be thrown onto this midden uh, along with animal droppings and human excrement so again if we're thinking of the smell of disease being able to spread this is all going to be very common there's not an understanding of um, sanitation 
Some houses have their own cesspits. So a cesspit is a pit or chamber which is used for collecting human excrement. Some at this time were made from stone, but these were quite expensive. So the vast majority had no lining and the excrement would have leaked into the cellars of neighbouring houses. So as much as they are trying to get somewhere to collect waste, um, these aren't well designed at the time. Despite the fact that some had cesspits, the majority didn't, and they would have simply dug shallow holes in the earth and squatted over them. They would have then covered the excrement with ash from the fire. So again, not hygienic at this time. Finally, the waste from the middens and cesspits would have been spread over the fields to fertilise the soil. So that is your overview of water and waste in the towns and the countrysides. As I've said, the red terminology on screen are the words that you would be expected to be using if you were to answer a question on living conditions and using water and waste as evident. So the final uh, part of living conditions then would be food. So first of all, we referenced this earlier, but the significance of the harvest in medieval England can't be understated. So nothing mattered more than a harvest in medieval England. A good harvest allowed health and comfort and a bad harvest led to death and death at a real extreme. So an event that you would be um, impressing the examiner if you could reference it is the Great Famine, which was between 1315 and 1316, and it killed approximately 10% of the population. So you have to have an awareness here in medieval England of the significance of harvest. And if you could reference that event, that would be great. In terms of bread, in damp conditions, a certain fungus grew on the rye bread, which was eaten predominantly by the poor, and this caused a disease called ergotism. So victims of this disease suffered from painful pustules on the skin and a burning sensation. Many went mad as a result of the disease, and medieval people believed it was caused by demons. So because they hadn't realised that, uh, that this fungus was growing on their one of the main items that they were eating, many continued to get ill and die. So again, that term ergotism, if you could reference that in the exam, it's very specific, it's in red for you on the screen, that would enhance your response for a medieval question. In terms of meat, fish and the rich, people who could afford it ate a wide variety of meat. So for example, venison or deer and beef, the church didn't allow people to eat meat on Fridays because Friday was seen as the day that Christ was executed. Um, so as a result of that, they don't eat animals that live on the land. They only ate fish um, and many villages created their own fish ponds to help them do this on Fridays. Uh, wealthy people also ate cheese, eggs, nut, nuts and fruit and used honey as a sweetener. So they did have a more varied diet than the poor. The poor, as we've said, were eating lots of rye bread. The other thing that they were eating was lots of pottage, which was a thick vegetable stew. Um, so as we said, along with bread, that was their most common staple. And finally, we've got food in the towns. So peasants often used the same cart that took rubbish to the middens to gain, uh, to transport, sorry, grain, fruit and fish to the market to be sold. So remember, our midden is our dung heap. So we've got peasants that are taking rubbish, uh, which obviously has excrement in it as well. And they are then using the same cart to put food goods into. So we know that disease is going to spread. We know that uh, dysentery is going to run wild as a result of this. Um, we also have a group called drovers who are people on foot who walked livestock such as cows and sheep into the towns as obviously we don't have vans or any, any other way of transporting them. So they walk them into the towns to be butchered. Uh, and butchery was causing an awful mess by the end of the Middle Ages. So butchers and fishmongers uh, at the end of our time period near 1500 were actually ordered to do their cutting on the outskirts of town to try and reduce the amount of mess that they were making within the towns. So within each time period of the public health exam, you need to know which epidemics uh, happened in which time period. So for medieval England, it is the Black Death. So the Black Death spread throughout Britain in 1348 to 1349. And historians estimate that the Black Death killed up to 60 percent of the population, which would be around 3.5 million people in just two years. So huge huge impact um, and if you could learn those statistics that would definitely impress an examiner if you're referencing this epidemic. 
It spread through the fleas that were living on rats at the time, but medieval people were not aware of this. So we're going to have a look at the beliefs of people within medieval England and what the actions were that they took. So first belief was that God were punishing people for their sins. Remember, we said that everybody during this time period was Roman Catholic. So they believe that um, people must have been sinning and therefore it is God that is punishing them. They also believed that it may have been the unusual movements of the planets. Miasma, which is an invisible poison in the air, which came from bad smells, was to blame. So we've spoken about the fact that the smells within the home because of animals being inside in the towns, because of all the animals that were roaming on the streets, as well as butchers, etc. Um, there would have been a lot of bad smells in the air and people believe that this was the cause of disease. It was also this belief in the imbalanced humours. So we spoke about the four humours earlier. So they believe that if one of those were out of balance, then people uh, would fall ill with the Black Death. And finally, they believe that it might be caused by looking a plague victim in the eye. So none of these beliefs at the time were anything uh, based on scientific theory. There was no scientific understanding. And as a result of that, we end up with these kind of beliefs for why people thought that the plague uh, was spreading. And as a result of that, the actions that uh, appear from people at the time aren't based on science and lots of these do not work. They arguably make things worse. So the first one, which is quite unusual, is the idea that they would tie live toads or chickens to the buboes, um, which would draw out the disease. We then had bloodletting, so literally making an incision in the arm to release blood to rebalance the humours. Obviously, this is going to cause infection as well because there wouldn't have been the sterilisation of implements. It could have also caused death, obviously, if someone cut through an artery, so not going to be effective at all. We have running away, so rich people in towns started to move to the countryside in the hope that the fresh air would cure them. Obviously, this is only going to benefit rich people and it would allow them to escape the Black Death. Um, but lots of poor people, which remember is the majority of society, don't have the ability to do that. We have a group called the Flagellants who were very religious and they whipped themselves, hoping that by punishing themselves, it would allow God to forgive them. So flagellants would be a great uh, group to reference in the exam if you did have a question on the Black Death, very specific vocabulary that would impress the examiner. Priests encouraged everyone to confess their sins and to pray. Um, and finally, we do have King Edward III who attempts to do something, but it is based on religion and superstition. So he orders that bishops arrange large, pro large processions of priests through cities, confessing the nation's sins and praying in the hope that it would then disappear. Um, the one thing that he does do as an example of intervention that could have had an impact was he wrote a letter to the mayor of London ordering him to clean up the city. Um, but this wasn't widespread across the country. Uh, it wasn't really followed up. And as a result, this has, has a very limited impact. So other than this, there's no intervention from the government or the king. And remember, again, that comes back to that term of laissez-faire. The government or the king here are not intervening. So the last section of the medieval uh, public health section is the approaches to public health. And these are in monasteries and in towns. So we're going to start off by reminding ourselves what a monastery is. So remember, it is those re really religious houses which are filled with monks uh, and they needed access to clean water for church services such as baptism, but also for providing drinking and washing water for those who were sick. So monasteries often had areas that were similar to hospitals and to enable people to be treated, they would need access to clean water. Uh, they actually began to have their own conduits. Remember, a conduit is a lead pipe which brought spring water to some town fountains from the countryside. And the monasteries are so wealthy that they have the money to build their own. So monasteries have been referenced uh, specifically in past exam questions, and you would need to know why they need access to fresh water and how they actually got that. Let's have a look then at the approaches to public health within the towns. So we're going to have a look at some problems, solutions and the effects of these. So the first problem that many towns had were filthy roads and marketplaces. So paving these was a solution that was introduced. 
and this came about through the use of taxation. So in Shrewsbury, not too far away, in 1301, um, people within the town were ordered that they needed to pay for marketplaces. This is going to lead to better trade, to cleaner roads, to hopefully less diseases. Um, and this is an, a, an example of government intervention, which we don't see much throughout the medieval period. So this would be a good example to reference. Second problem that we have are dung heaps or middens. Um, so these are moved to the edge of towns, which happens in Bristol and York, which is going to lead to a chance of uh, there being less bacteria and disease spreading. So it's a move in the right direction. It would be brilliant in the exam if you could reference Bristol and York specifically. Um, we know that this isn't going to cause um, a really significant impact to a lack of disease because you are simply moving the midden from one place to another. But nonetheless, in towns, it would improve the situation. Dumping waste, which was also a problem. Uh, so Norwich would be a really good example to use in the exam. They named and shamed people. This would have been an effective deterrent. Uh, people wouldn't have wanted to be named and shamed. So as a result of this, less people would dump their waste and we would end up with less disease as the effect. So um, the solution of naming and shaming would have helped improve public health. Poor quality meat was a problem at the time. So the solution to this was something called guilds or associations of food producers were set up who set the standards and find producers who didn't meet these. So a sophisticated system really for medieval England and it happened in Winchester in 1329 so again if you could reference that specifically in the exam that would see you uh, achieve a higher mark probably within a level for giving specifics and the effect of this is safer meat and other foods which leads to less diseases such as dysentery and um, so this is going to improve public health and finally, the problem that we are going to see um, throughout this time period is a lack of clean water. So the Mayor of London organised an extension of the pipes that supplied London with clean spring water. And he and other rich citizens actually left money in their wills to improve water supplies and build more public latrines. So remember, a latrine is a non-flushing toilet. So you can see here that the Mayor of London feels that there is a need to intervene, which is impressive at a time of such extreme laissez-faire. Um, the effect of this would have been more clean water for all and the fact that there would have been less waste spreading throughout the city, so less disease. So as much as we know that this time period is one of extreme late safe air, it is worth being able to reference at least a couple of these examples of uh, times where the government or the authorities did intervene to try and improve public health. So finally, Year 11, I've looked back through the past papers that we have from 2019. Um, you can see on the screen the questions that have come up. So you have three one mark questions. We haven't yet had a nine mark question for medieval time period. Uh, we've got two 10 mark questions and three 18 mark questions. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to have a look at how to answer the questions for public health. So there is a video for that on this YouTube channel um, and give these a go. Uh, teachers will be happy to mark them for you. So have a look at these questions after watching this video and hopefully you would be able to give these questions a really good go if they were to crop up in the exam. So the next video that I will be looking at for public health is our next time period, which is early modern England, 1500 to 1750.